first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing uh, this meeting because it uh, looks like just coming back to, to normal conditions and I'm very happy about that such that we can uh, communicate directly, which looks much, much easier and more and more efficient. So and, and second, uh, yeah, thanks for giving me the, just for having me here. Uh, so this work is a joint work with Felix Höfling, which we started just very recently. And this is about confined colloidal motion and how and why would we consider that like memory effects? So in the context of uh, non-Markovian dynamics or uh, generalized Langevin equation. So basically confined colloidal, colloidal motion, so colloidal means overdamped, and this was covered in the second talk pretty well. Uh, confined, in the previous talk we also had a very simple example where you can see what happens, and basically this is what I'm going to talk about. So generalized Langevin equations, they are efficient means just if you want to uh, reduce the complexity of a system. If you have many, many particles, you can just encap encapsulate a, num uh, uh, a big number of irrelevant degrees of freedom into memory kernel, and then you have an efficient model. So the second point is that, and this is a formidable challenge, this is really a serious task, is how to parameter, uh, parameterize the generalized Langevin equation, and in, in other words, how to extract the memory from the for a given system. So there are many studies which look at exactly the opposite problem when you have either a combination of uh, memory kernels, for instance, exponentials, like in the viscoelastic medium, and how you can uh, fit the given experimental data. So here, I want to really focus on the question, if you are given a set of experimental data or just a simulation data, and the statistic can be limited, so how you can extract the, uh, the memory kernel out of it. So on the basic ingredients of, uh, of our system, it's just the, uh, yeah, you have passive or active colloids, which means that they are overdamped. Then periodic potential, and this means that uh, you have some periodicity along one direction or in many directions. And the approach is data-driven. So data-driven in the sense you can be limited with statistics. So what can you do? So the, the, so the first problem is that it's not hard. Uh, it, it's not easy to solve this equation. And the second is that if the statistic is limited, you, you are really in trouble. So, and by answering the question why is it interesting, you can consider a number of systems where, for instance, if you can see the passive colloids, then you can have a number of systems where you have periodic conditions. For instance, you have an array of traps. So this is a completely one-dimensional geometry. And you have already confinement by the periodic potential. You can drive the system like with a constant force. And this was, again, uh, very similar to the previous talk. Or you can even temporarily uh, drive the, so for instance, with the temporal oscillations then this gives you more complicated effects like uh, mode blocking, temporal mode blocking. So on the other hand, if you go further, the geometry can be two-dimensional. The particles, there can be a lot of nanoparticles trapped in a, uh, in a potential. They are, can be interacting and so on. And additionally, you can drive them. And this gives you uh, the possibility of having giant diffusion and also directional locking. When the particles deflect from the uh, direction of the driving force, they start to move because of the interaction in some uh, other direction. So if you add activity to the system, then it becomes more, even more complicated and even more interesting. For instance, instead of the uh, energetic landscape, you can have a purely geometric landscape when you, when you have a number of colloidal particles glued together and put an active particle on top of that. So the particle fills the, uh, fills the background. And this is kind of uh, not strict, but still confinement. So there is thermal noise and so on. And due to activity, you can have the possibility that the particle just from time to time changes the direction of motion. So this is another factor which uh, makes the system interesting. If you additionally drive the system, so if you just put, if you take the simplest system just for a single particle, and if you drive it additionally with an external constant force, then you can see that for an active system, the dependent transition changes. So it looks very similar, but still you can demonstrate that the, uh, the behavior 
So the norm, the opinion transition norm from the, for, for the passive system is completely different. So the nature changes. And also the diffusion, uh, it's in some sense super, super uh, giant. So it's also giant, but you can increase due to the activity, you can also tune and it becomes, okay, not orders of magnitude larger, but still, uh, yeah, five or six or 10 times larger and so on. So this is the motivation. And if we start with the conventional Langevin equation, just for a single part, so this is our uh, generalized Langevin equation for a single particle for the velocity of mass m. Uh, zeta is, uh, plays the role of friction, and this is also the, uh, the memory kernel. So the fluctuation dissipation theorem is just to make sure that the thermal noise is, uh, is modeled in a, in a way that it doesn't break the physics. And then if you proceed to the velocity of the correlation function, and then if you do the Laplace Fourier transform, basically this means that you just transform your system from the real time to the frequency space, then there is a relation between the velocity of the correlation function and this memory kernel written in the frequency space. And this formula, this simple formula, without going into the deep math, you can consider as the definition of memory. So what you have here can be called memory for a conventional uh, um, underdamp system. And this is what we basically do. And to solve this equation, how to extract the memory, so this is basically not very easy, but still we have recently considered two situations which give you two routes how to extract the memory. One is just through the frequency space and another one just in the, in the time domain. So just to get the rough feeling how it works, if we consider the trivial, the simplest possible example of the Markovian friction, if you just have just an equation for a particle moving in a viscous medium, then uh, with thermal noise, then you can proceed. So this is just an immediate calculation for the velocity uh, autocorrelation function. Then you proceed to the mobility because they are related directly. And then you are uh, close to, the to this formula which defines the memory. And if you compare, so if you look at the previous slide here, you can just read off uh, this value and you see that there is no dependence on the frequency, it's just static friction. So this is trivial, but it, it just gives you a feeling how it works. So this is how we proceed in the frequency space. Of course, there are some subtleties, but still, this is the method which seems to work for real data. And if you want to do the same in the time domain, then uh, I just don't want to discuss the details. Just It's just a single paragraph, go around the formula 23 in this publication and, and, and try. What is important is that there are two things. First of all, if you start from the same equation, you don't integrate. You can integrate it, but it's much more efficient and less numerical errors if you go for the uh, time integral. So not directly for the core, but for the time integral. This is one thing, so this is doable. And the second one, if you discretize that and solve this solution, it looks a bit awful, but if you do the predictor character scheme, so if you take into account on the fly, if you take a weighted average of, of your result. So it doesn't look so awful and oscillating, it gets more and more reasonable. If you also can compare with the analytical solution. So I cannot prove mathematically that this is a, something the most reasonable in the world, but still is a, just a scheme which works, it's finally perfect. So now if we proceed to the case of confined colloidal motion, so confined and colloidal. First of all, confined, it can be trapped in an optical potential or somewhere else. And the particle, uh, yeah, if you just put and formulate an equation of motion, then we can ask a question, can we put the complexity given by the potential or the strapping force into the memory kernel? So this is how we coarse train the system. And the second point is that this is a colloid and they are usually slowly moving, so just Colloidal particles are one micrometer, so pretty large. And uh, they move with also micrometer per second, maybe at maximum 10 micrometer per second. So if you evaluate the uh, radiance number, so you see that it's an incredibly uh, low value. So this means that, so it basically measures the ratio of inertia to viscous forces. 
And this means that here, you can neglect the inertial term and proceed to the, uh, yeah, to the reduced system. So here, you have to, yeah, you have to make the decom decomposition. So this is not mathematically rigorous, but still, you split off the Markovian contribution and then put the rest. If you do the same, procedure as before, you have to modify the definition of your memory. So the formula looks similar, but it's not identical. And just to make sure that it works everything uh, as it should, so we just have considered a simple example where you trapped the particle, you didn't drive it, so everything is, you can calculate and uh, it works well. Uh, I don't go into the details. The only thing is that if you compare with uh, numerics with the analytics, uh, all the information about the constants, they are known. And this means that previously, for instance, in this system which I mentioned, we did it ad hoc in the sense that we have assumed something and now we know exactly why the diffusion and how it depends. So all the parametric dependencies are captured with that approach. So this means that physically it's not, uh, it's very transparent. So if the particle is freely diffusing, you have some background diffusivity. If it's trapped, then the diffusivity is uh, reduced. So just uh, the, the intensity of diffusive motion is suppressed. And in between, you have just the, the uh, crossover from one regime to another one. And now we know all the dependencies uh, in terms of original parameters within, uh, for this system. So this brings me to, to the conclusion and basically in typical MD, MD simulations or under damp systems, you can see and pretty much uh, capture long time tails and so on. So in contrast, for a colloidal system, you have to go to the overdamped limit that it seems helpful. And from the point of view of complexity reduction, so the memory function approach can give you some, some insights, some, some details about the parametric dependencies. Of course, probably you can get them uh, in the, in the standard way, but this is just for free, and uh, it looks like it makes sense. And uh, if you add activity, especially if you combine activity with the, uh, with the confinement, this makes the system really interesting. So this is an interplay of counteracting tendencies, and uh, this will, but yeah, this is just in progress. Thanks. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Any questions? Yes, Letizia. So you mentioned that there was some difference. You mentioned that there was some difference uh, in the depending uh, of an active particle. So can you say a little bit more? Uh, is it the beta exponent or is, is it the creep? Mean, the difference between what and what? Depending. Uh, at a certain point, you mentioned the pinning at the beginning. Uh, there. You? Yeah. Uh, Here. Go back. Uh, no, this one. No, maybe later. later. Four, I guess. This. No, one uh, more, less. <laughs> the active depending. Ah, I mean, uh, you mean active depending. Yeah. yeah. So there can you say a, a little bit more about the difference with the normal one? Well, you have to just consider the, the exponents of the transition because if you have no noise, it's just one half, the square root behavior. If you, if you go for the um, active noise, First, the, the uh, degree is different. And also, if you switch, if you keep the active noise, so there is thermal noise mm -hmm. and there is active noise, and they act differently. Okay. And if you completely switch off the thermal noise, then the, uh, the, um, the exponent in this transition will be dependent on the activity. So it, it, it really it works like a parameter. So this means that it's no but longer one. But you mean the exponent in the creep, or you? Uh, I mean it's no longer one half. Just the, the short answer. Okay. Any further questions? Yes. So I, I'm not sure I got everything, but you know, uh, it seems to me that you are saying, okay, so give me the experimental data and we'll uh, get your memory function or effective Lamarckian equation, no? Essentially. Or yeah, whatever. This is the dream. This is the dream. So my question is, what happens if your equation is both uh, 
Langevin equation is both nonlinear and non-Markovian? That's hard. That's even, <laughs> even not easy in, in the simplest case when you have just a linear equation because, well, it's not just, uh, yeah, you don't know if it works. Okay. If it works, okay. If it doesn't work, you have to think what to modify. I don't know. Okay. Pragmatic answer. Uh, any other questions? If not, then let's thank all the, uh, there is, I think that's Andrea's comment. Yeah. I'm not sure, but. Apparently we have several chats and we only see one. Yes, please, uh, those following online, send the questions in the chat so that is visible, they are visible to everyone. Yeah, if anybody is interested, you can just send me an email. So the... Or you can send an email to Sarah. As well. yeah. or, or preferably all of the, all of the yeah. mentioned. In particular, <laughs> the email is... <laughs> Apparently, she has a big inbox. So. <laughs> Okay, then uh, if there are no further questions, then let's thank uh, the speakers of the entire session and enjoy lunch. So maybe for the lunch